Hi folks, welcome to Philosophy According to Eddie, and today we are going to have a look at gender and theology. Um, now there has been a pretty poor relationship in the past between um, orthodox understandings of Christianity and feminism. They have not gone very well together because uh, generally Christian institutions, particularly Roman Catholicism, Church of England to a slightly lesser degree, uh, and also quite a lot of um, the, the Reformed churches, are all very patriarchal. Uh, it's this idea of a male God, um, the Bible could be seen as disempowering towards women, women aren't allowed to be bishops, uh, in, in some uh, branches of Christianity, and so there's a lot of patriarchal institutions in place that elevate men above women, and often are seen as oppressive towards women as well. Um, also this idea of God above and humans below is kind of a master-slave type relationship according to some feminist thinkers. And so um, Rosemary Radford Ruther and Mary Daly have come up with two feminist theologies to try to get around this, to try to uh, examine whether there is a fundamental patriarchy and sexism within Christianity, even a violence towards women that could be exemplified by 2 Samuel 13, 1 to 32, uh, the rape of Tamar by Amnon. Now, Rosemary Radford Ruther believes that liberation for women is possible through Christ, but it needs a re-evaluation of um, the orthodox understanding of Christ. Um, she believes that there are many female aspects of God, um, she refers to as goddess at times as well. Equality was present in the early Christian communities between men and women um, and that should be returned to and also there are feminine aspects of Jesus unlike um, other sort of warrior messiah type male role models. So all of these ideas suggest that maybe um, Christianity at its roots is not fundamentally sexist. And the key question is, can the male Jesus save women? Mary Daly, however, um, believes that Christianity actually needs a transvaluation, so the values of Christianity need to be completely removed and rebuilt in sort of complete nut and bolt, if you like, rebuilding of Christianity by stripping it down and putting it back together from a feminine perspective. So transformation of the patriarchy needs to be done by women. It can't be done by men, uh, because women have got uh, a particular female being, a, a way of being that we will consider um, within nature, as a, as a closer relationship to nature, and also the fact that they live in the background, which we will explain later. And therefore, um, language also needs to be transformed as well. Uh, Anti-feminine language needs to be removed um, and there needs to be a rebuilding of those practices of religious language. And the key question for Mary Daly is why is it that Christianity, as we know it today, is inherently sexist? And the question that then leads on from that is can it be saved? Rosemary Radford Ruther suggests that Christianity can be rebuilt. The idea is that feminism and liberation theology together um, could alter Christian spirituality and praxis. Now praxis is the idea of putting theory into action, it's the process of putting theory into action. Uh, liberation theology, there is another video on that um, and Marxism uh, that will be coming later. But these two ideas together, feminism and liberation theology, can alter spirituality and praxis in Christianity to make it more feminine. The removal of this patriarchal hierarchy that's been put in place by monotheistic religions, uh, particularly Christianity, and the male dominance that comes about as a result, um, can be done within Christianity. This removal process can be made. The first idea that Rosemary Radford Ruther had was the idea of goddess. Judaism, ancient Judaism, is monotheistic, um, but retains the idea of a goddess, and we see this in Isaiah 42, 14. 
um, where um, there is a, a definite blurring between the ideas of masculine God and feminine God. The idea is that wisdom is a feminine trait in Judaism and in ancient Greek. In ancient Hebrew, it's Chokmah, uh, excuse my pronunciation, and in ancient Greek, it's Sophia. These both mean wisdom. And we see this in the wisdom of Solomon, wisdom 7 and wisdom 8, where Solomon's bride apparently is wisdom, Sophia. Now Jesus, even though he's male, is an embodiment of wisdom, and therefore, in a sense, is an embodiment of these female traits. Uh, and we see this in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 23-24, and in John 1, 1-3, and 1, 14. Now, because Jesus was male, the word logos is used. Logos um, literally translates to word. And if we think about, you know, even Genesis, um, you know, the word, um, Jesus is the word, that sort of thing. Um, and that's because logos is a masculine variant of wisdom. So Jesus is still wisdom here. It's just that uh, they're using uh, St. Paul's using the term Logos rather than Sophia because Jesus is male. However, there's also the suggestion that the Holy Spirit um, is in fact um, Sophia as well. It is wisdom, it's the female variant of, of, of wisdom, Sophia. And so the Son and the Spirit, Jesus and the Holy Spirit together as a kind of male and female wisdom combined. This evidence is there in the Bible. Combine this with the fact that in ancient Greek, which is one of the early languages used for the Bible, um, God actually, um, although be, well, God is portrayed as male, but in ancient Greek, um, if you didn't know the gender of something, you'd refer to it as being male. Opens up, this opens up the possibility that in fact, God is of no particular gender. Um, and therefore could be male or female or both. The problem is Christianity has ignored this in order to support its own patriarchy. But Rosemary Radford Ruth suggests that the evidence is there to suggest that Christianity could be rebuilt um, in a more female-friendly way. Early Christian communities um, were considered by Rosemary Radford Ruth to be egalitarian. Um, they, in fact, undermine the patriarchy rather than supporting it. Um, this is shown through Jesus referring to God as Abba. Now, that term essentially means kind of like dad or even daddy. It's not like a father, sir, lord type structure um, of, uh, of hierarchy. It's in the same way that you would refer to your dad. It's a, it's a closeness. It's a, uh, an equality. Um, and this was all used to back up the idea that family ties and structures were being challenged. All were equal in God. And all were close to God. We can see this in John 15. And Rosemary Radford Ruth criticises Christianity for turning patriarchal as it went mainstream. And that it should return to its roots in uh, male and female being equal in Jesus. And in God. Finally, inclusive apophatic language, um, following that sort of the apophatic use of analogy, um, suggests that we should consider God to be beyond gender. Traditionally, uh, male language has been used for transcendence and female language has been used for immanence. However, God is beyond language and therefore we can't strictly say one thing is uh, male, one thing is female. It's only an analogy. It's only used to help humans understand their situation. So, yeah, gender language can be used if it's helpful and if it's used carefully. But if we get to a position where we don't need it, then we shouldn't use it. And whatever we do, it must reject the patriarchy. We should re reject patriarchal language in favour of um, a more inclusive, apophatic approach. So, the million dollar question. Can Jesus save women if he is male? 
And initially, Rosemary Radford Ruther suggests that in terms of traditional Christianity, the answer is a pithy no. Jesus is seen as the perfect human, uh, Jesus is male, therefore the male is the perfect human. Uh, a bit of slightly twisted Aristotelian syllogism there for you, but that has basically been the idea of traditional Christianity um, since the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire presented Jesus as ostensibly male. Now, the Romans considered women to be inferior to men, and that was true in their public life. And this meant that when the Roman Empire took on Christianity in about 380 AD-ish, um, they suppress all this goddess element. And the goddess element had been there since the start. It part of the Jewish tradition, uh, but also part of prehistoric religions. Um, there have always been gods and goddesses, male and female, but the Roman Empire really, it looks like, according to Ruther, uh, they were the ones who squashed it out and led to um, Jesus becoming more male, Christianity being more patriarchal getting rid of all the things that exist within Christianity, according to Rosemary Radford Ruther, which are more female. And the normally relatively logical Aquinas um, makes the um, frankly stunning assertion, um, stunning in a bad way, that um, women are misbegotten men, um, that they have been born wrong, um, and that only men can be part of the ministry. Um, which is really surprising, because most of Aquinas' material is very logical, particularly his philosophies. Um, and this became very, very popular. And in Inter Insignores, uh, Insignores, sorry, in 1976, this idea was still being trotted out. Um, so, traditional Christianity, Roman Catholicism in particular, seems to be very tied up in its patriarchy, in this hierarchy. However, if you go back to the radical ancient roots of Christianity, Rosemary Radford Ruther suggests, yes, Jesus can save women. Go back to that liberation theology, this idea that Jesus is there for the marginalised, for the oppressed, and for anyone, regardless of whether they're male or female. Um, there's plenty of evidence for this. Resurrection is very, very similar to the death and birth cycles that goddess, um, the goddesses in ancient and more modern religions are associated with. So Jesus' resurrection is a particularly fe a feminine thing. Jesus is more feminine, according to Rosemary Radford Ruther, in many ways, um, than um, many other warrior messiahs. Um, most male um, saviors tend to be sword in hand, slaying enemies, not Jesus. He turns the other cheek. Um, he encourages forgiveness, encourages tolerance, inclusion. This, um, Rosemary Radford Ruther suggests, is a more feminine approach. The Holy Spirit, therefore, um, carries on Jesus' call to challenge these self-interested institutions, these patriarchal institutions that are holding back the true message of Christ. And therefore, in summary, Jesus should be seen as a liberator. His masculinity is irrelevant because there is plenty of femininity in Christianity, there is plenty of femininity in Jesus, uh, the idea of Sophia, the idea of um, th this sort of goddess cycle. All of this supports the idea that there is a place for women in Christianity, but Christianity needs to be rebuilt away from all the traditional stuff in order to properly understand it, and then it will be suitable for feminism. Mary Daly, like Rosemary Radford Ruther, um, was initially Catholic, brought up in a, uh, uh, well, grew up as Catholic, um, but then um, unlike Rosemary Radford Ruther, who wanted to hang on to some elements of Christianity and Catholicism, uh, Mary Daly um, came to the conclusion that um, women must move to a post-Christian spirituality. Christianity hasn't got anything for women as it is at the moment. Um, even if you feminised God, um, or, or reintroduced the feminine aspects, as uh, Rosemary Radford Ruth suggested, it would still be an essentially male 
God and religion because of the institutions such as the churches which are patriarchal. And so the only thing to do is to become post-Christian, move beyond traditional religion. And this means a transvaluing of Christianity. Now transvaluing is the re-evaluation of all the values. So taking it all to pieces and actually starting again, uh, not even with the original pieces, but just rebuilding from scratch. And this idea comes from Friedrich Nietzsche. Rosemary Redford Ruther uh, believed that you could take the pieces and rebuild them, whereas Mary Daly thought that you've got to build again from scratch. And Daly suggested if God is male, then the male is God. So basically, if, if God is considered to be masculine, then uh, men become uh, essentially uh, gods in society. She takes Nietzsche's ideas of uh, the Apollonian and the Dionysian and goes with those. Now, the Apollonian is the destructive, passive side of the, uh, the human psyche. Uh, it's the, uh, the one that likes to hold on to patriarchal um, structures and that sort of thing. It's destructive uh, and it's uh, naturally male. Uh, because Apollo, male god. Um, and you know, we're looking at patriarchal systems here. And this is uh, opposed to the creative, active side of the personality, which is the Dionysian, um, the female side, according to uh, both Nietzsche and Mary Daly. But Mary Daly believes that only women have access to the Dionysian, uh, whereas men, uh, so, yeah, because basically men can't get beyond the Apollonian. And this is the Apollonian veil that um, masculinity experiences. It's the creation of false, alienating ideas and that alienate uh, creativity um, and alienate um, the sort of growth that you get with femininity. Um, and what life should be is um, a creative Dionysian process of being. Now, being is the idea that um, you, that one can um, continually keep re-understanding, re-evaluating and learning about life from nature. So quite a sort of, um, in a sense going back to, to even beyond the roots that Rosemary Redford Ruth was suggesting and going back to almost like a, a pre-Christian idea of spirituality. And so as a result, because um, only women can access the Dionysian side, only women can transvalue God. Men just aren't up to the job um, because uh, they don't have the Dionysian side. So God the Father must be re-evaluated, must be rejected, and being must be the way to go. Now a lot of these terms will be very new, a lot of these terms are um, unfamiliar in uh, perhaps traditional academic discourse at a level, um, but that's because uh, not very much feminism is taught, so these terms will be unfamiliar. Uh, you may need to take a little bit of time to learn them. So, we need to move towards a new language as well. If we're talking about new ideas, creating new ideas, we need to move beyond old traditional language. And the traditional linguistic ideas are that men are in the foreground and women are in the background. So men are taking the leading role, um, they are driving language, they are driving language creation, and therefore they're driving all of the things that are supported by language, including religious language, uh, religious texts, uh, the stories that back those up. Everything is masculinized. Um, and this is the Ap Apollonian foreground. It's destructive, it's led by snools, who are the male leaders who reinforce the patriarchy, and henchwomen, who are the women who play along with the male snools. And the women have been pushed into the background, they're not creating the language, they're being constructed as passive. Uh, yeah, the men are constructing them as passive, suggesting that they are passive, but actually, what Mary Daly is suggesting is that in the background, women have found their Dionysian side. They're actually being very creative, away from the men who think they're being creative but are actually being destructive by, create, by rebuilding these patriarchies. Women are reimagining their lives in the shadow of the men. 
They're reclaiming language. They're refinding the being. They're actually getting closer to God and spirituality than the men are, even though the men think that they're doing better. So essentially, women need to take charge of this new language because they're the ones who are actually getting closer to um, the true spirituality and that true sense of being. Now this idea of being will continue to change. And language will continue to change because it's an ongoing process. It's not fixed because fixing something is destructive. It's always growing. It's always being recreated because this is a Dionysian phenomenon. Interestingly, uh, Nietzsche was rejected by Mary Daly um, because uh, as a man, his use of language and his use of Apollonian and Dionysian um, actually um, was reinforcing the patriarchy as, as Mary Daly uh, considered. Um, so I suppose that there's a good chance that um, I'm reinforcing the patriarchy as I'm talking to you, being male. Um, but um, it, it's, it's um, suggesting that it is women who need to take control of language and of being in order to truly get closer to God. Mary Daly believes that another reason why women must move to post-Christian spirituality is because Christianity has been a significant root cause of abuse of women. Um, she looks to things such as Jesus' death on the cross as a symbol of male violence, uh, the male love of torture um, and of pain, uh, and especially the sexual oppression of women. And she backs this up with the idea of the Virgin Mary, who is traditionally portrayed as a symbol of purity by men, by being sort of the Virgin Mother. But actually, she suggests that uh, it makes her into a hollow eggshell, i.e. just a, uh, a vessel to contain the, uh, the egg that was Jesus, with no value of her own. And also that she was a total rape victim, i.e. she was um, subject to the worst rape possible. Um, God basically just used her as a way of creating his son on earth, uh, rendering her um, completely passive and, um, and also rendering all future women as um, being at risk of this violence and that violence being justified um, because of the Virgin Mary. So this, uh, this idea led on to the concept of the most unholy trinity, which is where the Apollonian nature of uh, the male patriarchy um, shows itself in its ugliest way. The rape, as mentioned before, of women and the abuse of women, you know, the metaphorical rape in general is what um, Daly is referring to. But it's the idea of women being abused, subjugated, and that they should expect this and accept this. Genocide. Thinking back to ideas such as those in, in the Crusades, that... Um, one religion should wipe out another. This is very Apollonian, according to Daly. This idea of destruction, of elimination, um, and the, the, the violence of Christianity there being shown. And war, which she considers to be the most Apollonian thing. This idea of this hypocrisy of um, killing each other. Um, but then, on the other hand, condemning ideas such as euthanasia and abortion, uh, although war is seen as, as, as acceptable and even praised by religious leaders if it's done to further the Apollonian um, patriarchal cause. So for Mary Daly, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit become rape, genocide and war, the unholy trinity. And this is a very important concept. Um, in understanding why Christianity specifically is, a, is being attacked here because um, a lot of what was said initially you could argue is just an anti-patriarchal idea but this idea of, of women being the, the subjects of abuse and uh, being the victims of the most unholy trinity you can sort of see why um, Christianity is, uh, is being rejected here and so Daly suggests that essentially men have 
in short, men have ruined things and so women have to take over. And she refers to the only true friendship as being lesbian. Now, initially, that would suggest you know, the idea of um, women as friends and as lovers. She rejects the term homosexuality. That's a patriarchal term, so we're, we're rejecting that. Um, but she's suggesting that it has to be female with female. Interestingly, later on, she then suggested, well, that's a gender thing, not a sex thing. I.e., um, it is uh, the idea of, it, it doesn't have to be just women with women. There is a place for men if men accept their feminine gender. Then they can accept this friendship. Um, a slightly difficult idea, um, in a sense, because um, although the, this, the idea of uh, men embracing, uh, or the, the idea of gender fluidity, rather than it being um, a sex idea, the idea of masculine being feminine is one that perhaps Mary Daly hasn't thought about quite so well. But, she does reject the claim um, that um, there is no male or female in Christ. That was in Galatians 3.28. She thinks that this is just a, uh, a, a rather poor attempt to justify what's happened to women over the past. So as far as she's concerned, Christianity's blown it, men have blown it, women need to rebuild this spirituality, and she calls it spinning, referring back to the way that women would spin cloth together. And, she, and so this idea of female relationships linking together, spinning a new spirituality as you'd spin, uh, as you'd create cloth from spinning the fibres. So all in all, Christianity must be rejected, and women should be um, the ones who lead the way in their Dionysian way to create the new um, spirituality. Rosemary Radford Ruther and Mary Daly share some similarities, but also have some differences. Their similarities are, they both um, accept this idea of uh, God being fundamentally patriarchal, and therefore must be reimagined. Um, and they also accept the sort of ecological idea that um, feminism is closer to nature and to natural human relationships than uh, the patriarchy is. Uh, and the, the, the hierarchies within the patriarchy damage these relationships. So therefore, women have the important role of reimagining uh, religion and spirituality uh, because they have something special about them that men don't. Um, and this leads to the idea that uh, women have this unique role in transforming the ideas into reality, this praxis idea, uh, and that within society um, it is the women who will be transforming the relationship with nature and transforming the social reality. However, there are differences. Whereas uh, Rosemary Radford Ruther accepts the sort of goddess aspects of ancient Judaism um, and such, Mary Daly suggests that we're too far gone and God must be totally rejected and transvalued. As far as Rosemary Reverend Ruther um, considers, God, according to the Bible, still does exist um, uh, in the way that has been suggested. It's just that it's got corrupted, whereas Mary Daly suggests God needs to be completely replaced with the idea of nature. Um, Rosemary Reverend Ruther suggests that sometimes women must act separately to men in order to achieve uh, the correct outcomes of Christianity, um, but Mary Daly goes further and says that women must be totally independent, that men basically have no role in this whatsoever. Rosemary Redford Ruther is looking for reformation, whereas Mary Daly is looking for total rejection of Christianity. Rosemary Redford Ruther is inclusive of um, Christianity and of men, um, Mary Daly is exclusive, believing that this needs to be a non-Christian, non-male, female interpretation of spirituality. 
There are several strengths of Rosemary Radford Ruther and Mary Daly. Rosemary Radford Ruther is inclusive. She brings in religion and uh, secular feminism. She brings in men and women. She just shifts the balances of power. She's very liberating. She always talks about sort of freeing people from the constraints of patriarchy and hierarchies. And that counts for men as well as women. There is a theological basis for what she's said. She uses a lot of references to the Bible and to, uh, to the scriptures and to early Christianity. So she's obviously very well researched in this. So there's a very good, solid, academic, theological base. However, some would argue that she's got poor grounding for her theories. She cherry-picks the correct verses that back up her point and ignores others. And that um, has led to her being criticised. She politicises Jesus, and some think that, that Jesus is being politicised as a liberator and a sort of um, political figure far too much. Some would argue, that, particularly within the Catholic Church, that she compromises God's sovereignty. So God is supposed to be the ultimate power and the greatest, um, the greatest of all creation. And um, Rosemary Radford Ruther is accused of undermining that um, by trying to reimagine God from what has been said in the holy texts. And uh, the more traditional and uh, conservative uh, uh, Christian churches suggest that she's rejecting the natural order of things. Um, and that the natural order is very clear of men and women, and it's been outlined in really Aristic Tar 10 and in the Bible, and she's just rejecting that with no good reason. Now, Mary Daly um, is, is obviously the more extreme of the two. She's come up with a whole set of new linguistic theories. She's close to some of the more um, forthright secular feminists. Strengths are that she exposes society's flaws. She's going there and actually addressing these at the root cause, uh, whereas Ruther could be accused of trying to fix the, uh, the perhaps the easier aspects, but not go down to the root cause. This is a radical reimagining. She is going to places that others haven't gone and is pushing the debate forward. And she's arguing that she's resetting the relationship with God. Um, and changing it completely, getting rid of all of the patriarchy. However, there are criticisms. Um, firstly, that it's very, very exclusive. Even though she doesn't say it explicitly, the way that she writes is implicitly targeted at white, western, educated, lesbian women. And others tend to feel marginalised by this. And she doesn't really include them in. In fact, she's very narrow in her approach, and at times very disrespectful. Um, she calls anyone who's found spirituality through Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, anything other than Christianity, she refers to them as being in the foreground as snools or henchwomen. So she's very, very um, critical and narrow-minded of what is, um, what is acceptable. And one could argue this is very irrational. Where has she got these ideas from? Um, how can she say, uh, with so little um, justification seemingly, that all of these people are in the foreground and snools? And um, how is this in any way related to Christianity? It seems to be completely different. Um, it talks about resetting the relationship with God, but also talks about getting rid of God altogether. And at the very least, it's incredibly extreme. And she does alienate um, heterosexual women, uh, men. Um, in, in fact, it, it, she, she marginalises a lot of people. And a lot of people think that she's gone far too far. Both Rosemary Radford Ruther and Mary Daly, however, can be, con uh, can be uh, criticised for essentialising gender and sexuality. Something I haven't mentioned up to this point, but it's a very important one. They are accepting and playing into the idea that gender is that of male and female, that sexuality is that of 
um, heterosexual and homosexual. They do not consider the idea of gender fluidity, of fluidity of sexuality. They do not include these in their theories, and as such, they could be seen to be reinforcing structures of gender and sexuality. And particularly for Mary Daly, who's trying to get rid of all the patriarchy and all the structures, um, this is quite a, quite a big criticism. But it is also for Rosemary Radford Ruther, who's trying to suggest um, that the hierarchy needs to be taken apart. In fact, both could be um, criticised in a sense of being Apollonian in their approach, in that they're actually, much like Mary Daly criticised Nietzsche for um, supporting the patriarchy by his language, they are supporting the patriarchy by their language of binary gender and binary sexuality. So, in terms of gender and theology, they are, in a sense, actually reinforcing the gender stereotypes and structures that they were both setting out to try to change within Christianity. So there you have it. We've looked at gender and theology today, looking at uh, Rosemary Radford Ruther, who believes that Christianity can be rebuilt based on its roots, and Mary Daly, who believes that actually Christianity needs to be transvalued by taking it all apart and starting again. So, if you have any questions, of course, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching. See you next time.